MIT, everyone, um, and thank you to all who are with us this morning in person or participating remotely by the phone bridge or on the live webcast. We'll begin with a few introductory remarks from MIT President L. Raphael Reif. The president will then introduce Professors Esther Duflo and Professor Obajit Banerjee. They'll speak, after which we'll take questions from the room and from our you know, journalists participating remotely. We'll provide a few additional instructions at that point. Thank you so much, President Reif and Esther and Obashid. Thank you, Kimberly, and, and welcome, everyone. Good, sunny, beautiful morning today. Uh, I'm delighted to tell you officially what you already know. This morning, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences announced the, that MIT's Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, along with their colleague, Professor Michael Kramer of Harvard, have been awarded the 2019 Sveria Ripskang Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. As the Academy noted in bestowing the honor, this year's laureates have considerably improved our ability to fight global poverty. In just two decades, their experiment-based approach has transformed development economics, which is now a flourishing field of research. In fact, in an interview this morning, Professor Duflo acknowledged what she described as a movement of hundreds of researchers who work to advance solutions in global poverty. The fourth international professor of economics, Professor Banerjee, joined the MIT faculty in 1993 the Abdul Latif Jamil Professor of Poverty Alleviation and Development Economics, Professor Duflo, joined the MIT faculty six years later. In 2003, they teamed up to co-found the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, or JPAL, a global network of anti-poverty researchers. JPAL studies the impact of local interventions on social problems and extends successful efforts more broadly. The essence of their work is to make sure that the global fight against poverty is based on scientific evidence so that policymakers have a systematic way to understand which interventions work, which do not, and why. By providing an experimental basis for development economics, Professor Banerjee and Duflo have reimagined their field and profoundly changed how governments and agencies around the world intervene to help people in poverty. In doing so, they provide a proud reminder of MIT's commitment to bring knowledge to bear on the world's great challenges. The Institute's mission calls on us to use our distinctive grounding in science and technology to make the world a better place in service to humanity. That is the definition of j -Pal. Professors Banerjee and Duflo are the sixth and seventh individuals to win the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences while serving on MIT's faculty. With this achievement, they build on the remarkable legacy of professors Paul Samuelson, Franco Modigliani, Robert Solo, Peter Diamond, and Ben Holmstrom. MIT Economics is known for its combination of superb economic talent and a commitment to making a better world. And Abhijit and Esther stand as a wonderful example of both. We're deeply proud of our newest Nobel laureates and the entire economics department. And on that note, please join me welcoming Professors Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo. Thank you. It feels a bit like I walked onto the set of a wrong movie. Uh, I, I guess the one thing I wanted to start by saying is that I think, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful to get this prize, but it's particularly wonderful, I think, 
because it's a prize not, I think, for us, but also for the entire movement. I think that this is a movement that we happen to be at the beginning of, I think mostly luck, and, um, it, but it's grown to be a worldwide movement. There are about 400 professors who are in one form or the other associated with J. Powell's work, and they all do uh, randomized control trials on issues that as diverse as, you know, uh, U U.S. Um, school, uh, schools in the Appalachia to uh, governance problems in Indonesia and um, getting children Im immunized in India, um, get getting children under bed nets in Sub-Saharan Africa. So all, this is this is a this is a movement that, ha in some ways, um, we we are kind of the beneficiaries of, we, we get often, in the press people say, j -Pal's research has, has showed, uh, we take great pride in it, we had nothing to do with the research, we didn't raise any money for it, we, we, it just happened and we, we got the credit for it. It's great, it's a, it's a, it's a, we're in a rontier economy at this point. Uh, this, but it's still, I think it's still going to be wonderful for the movement that this prize was given because I think it's going to make it a little easier to penetrate the many doors that you know are half open to us or not quite open to us and hopefully bring the message of, of uh, policy based on evidence and hard thinking to, the, to many other places as well. The world today is full of somewhat uh, depressing news, especially in the international geopolitical stage. And in the middle of this depressing news, the one hopeful thing there is is that the fate of the world's poor has really tremendously improved over the last three decades. People don't tend to realize that. Uh, people in the US usually are persuaded that uh, poverty keeps increasing, for example. But the truth is that over the last three decades, the two groups that did relatively well in the world's economy are the ultra-rich and the ultra-poor. Why are the ultra-poor doing better? Or in part because some economies are growing fast. In part also because, uh, in particular India and China, but in part also because the policies that uh, aim to help the poor cope with the issues that they face have improved. Infant mortality has been cut in half since 1990, maternal mortality by even more than that. And that has happened in countries that are not particularly wealthy and even in countries that have not become richer. Even in the poorest countries, there have been progress on these important issues. Almost all of the children go to school, for example. If policies have improved, largely it's not because of us, <laughs> to be honest. But I think that entire movement that Abhijit talked about has played a small role in it, in that it has, I think, raised the possibility and the hope that one could be a little bit more rigorous about uh, what policies and what type of things can really help the poor. Rigorous in two ways, rigorous in designing the policies, not based on your intuition or whatever happens to be the flavor of the month, but based on a better understanding of how the poor live, why they make the choices they make, what are the specific traps that hold them back, and how to, what lever to push that could unlock these traps. Better also, more rigorous also in the way that accepting the possibility that maybe you didn't get it right exactly the first time, and that innovating, experimenting is useful. And that is something that, of course, the two of us, the three of us, uh, with Michael Kramer could never have achieved. Uh, but that is something that this entire movement of going at it with a lot of persistence and a lot of details in the big and in the small and small, small project and giant project progressively has achieved. And the hope now you know, with JPL North America and JPL Europe and JPL LAC is that some of this rigor that we try to develop in the poor countries moves back up north and we also uh, improve uh, our understanding of what are 
people's real trouble, our respect for them and their dignity, and uh, therefore a better, more imaginative solution to solve these issues. Abhijit rightly put this in the broader context of the big movement that is changing development economics uh, and has much beyond us, but I want to bring it back a little bit to the more local <laughs> environment of MIT. As you know, I'm a MIT product through and through, came to do my PhD here, was hired as an assistant professor against all norms, I uh, never left. <laughs> um, when I made this choice, many wise people told me that it was a horrible career move and was probably leading to perdition. I said, I understand that it's not good to stay in your own institution, but I think this is here that I have the right environment to pursue what I want to pursue. I've not been regretting this choice uh, in... <laughs> for any number of reasons. <laughs> and uh, so I want to thank, uh, first of all, the department from my advisor. It's a bit awkward because it's one of them. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, 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 Josh Angrist, uh, who is the other one, and Michael Kramer, who I guess makes it doubly awkward. <laughs> and um, the, also the entire faculty uh, who taught me, and all of the uh, students who were with me. And I think together, so this is not a part that uh, Abhijit uh, uh, enjoyed as a student since he had the misfortune of being down the road, uh, but um, we also want to thank the department uh, for being a wonderful place uh, to work and to talk about economics, and maybe in particular banked uh, I'm sure, who I think so much before us, the possibility of the idea we had, the first time we thought about forming something. He was the chair of the department, and he told us, we both vividly remember, you have a product that is going to uh, um, make a big difference. I was like, whatever, and sure, can you get us a bit of money so we hire someone? <laughs> And then uh, the second very important person in development of JPAL that we want to acknowledge here is Susan Hockfield, who, when she came as president of MIT, just before Raphael met us, in fact, I think just before she became president, met us, and we explained what we were working on. And she's like, oh, you're bringing the middle of science to social science. This is so refreshing. I'm going to help you. And she was true to her word, and she helped us in many ways, nurturing, always ready to talk, uh, and also, uh, quite frankly, putting us in front of uh, possible uh, donors. And in that, we met, I think, uh, Mohammed, Mohammed Jamil, who is the third person that we really want to acknowledge in the birth of Jepal, Mohammed Jamil, who saw in us maybe a little bit like banked, and maybe for, for the same reason that he has business acumen that none of us really had, who saw in us uh, and in our project something that uh, could make a difference and decided to risk his reputation and his money uh, behind that. This would not have happened without the ecosystem. This would not have happened, of course, without his vision and his commitment for uh, the world's poor, which was very apparent then and still apparent today. Um, this is the type of uh, outstanding people that uh, you want to have associated with the uh, university. And finally, I think on behalf of both of us, we want to thank all the students, the ones who have been our students uh, forever uh, and who are, some of them are still in the room today. Uh, some of them are gone in the wild world who have you know, who, who have formed a great big families and community. And all of the students who are here, who are not our students, but make our days exciting uh, every single morning that we wake up and come here. And all of the staff of JPAL here and worldwide, 
all maybe hundreds of them, uh, and in particular, the leadership and the vision of Rachel Glenester, the first uh, executive director of JPL, and Iqbal Daliwal, who succeeded her when she went on bigger and better things. Thank you very much for coming here on a Monday uh, of holidays. We deeply appreciate it. Thank you so much for those beautiful remarks. So in addition to those in this room, like I said, there are many more participating remotely by the phone bridge and by the webcast today. So what we're going to do just for the journalists in the room is we're going to alternate between the room, the phone bridge, and the webcast. And I have some of the webcast cards in front of me. Um, so we're going to try to accommodate as many of your questions as we can today. So we can bring you back up. Uh, first question from the room. I decided you to pursue this particular method. At which point did you, did you think this is a worthwhile um, method to pursue? I, I, I think a uh, combination of actually, I, I think by the time I understood what it takes to get answers to empirical questions right, I thought the method, uh, and most of that sounded hokey to me. Uh, most of the work that was seen as an established truth in 1990, including my own work, some of it, I thought was a little bit hokey. And, I, and that made it much more attractive to look for a method that would give me a little more confidence in what, what uh, we were doing. And I think that that's, it was, came out of mostly frustration, often with myself. As I said, I'm a student of Josh Angrist, and uh, the way that I've been taught to learn about the world is uh, how, you, how can you get as close as possible to a randomized control trial. So as soon as I had a little bit more flexibility and freedom and time, I was like, why do I need to be close to a randomized control trial? Why can't we just like do it? <laughs> Any more questions from the room before we go to the bridge? Oh, yes, right over there. A real one or a fake one? <laughs> Our real belief for education is as follows. Every kid can learn, but they cannot learn if they are taught something that is so far away from what they already know that there is no way they can catch up. Unfortunately, there are millions and millions and millions of children who are in school, whose parents are very excited about school, who themselves are very excited about school, and get completely discouraged within days or within weeks because they don't understand what's going on, because they have no reason to understand, because they are taught something that is way too advanced for them. And they, are be they have been made to understand that they are stupid and they will never succeed. We spend a lot of our career and work with a wonderful NGO called Pratham that we work with to try and change that. And that's a great question. Thank you. So we're going to, um, very quickly, they're going to take a question from the phone bridge, and they're going to have to pipe the audio explaining the instructions to the room. So we're going to do that right now. My apologies. Thank you. For the audio participants, that is star one to ask a question. Do we have our first question? No. Oh, OK. Can you just describe in detail, um, and sorry if you're into this, we'd love to know more about that moment when you got the phone call. <laughs> you were more awake than I was. <laughs> A lot more awake. Can I be transparent? Uh, so my phone rang and I picked it up and it says it's an important call from Sweden and I thought to myself, well now that you woke me up, just go ahead. <laughs> and then um, someone uh, very serious person told us, they told me that you've been awarded the, um, the full name of the prize that I don't yet know. <laughs> that I'll, I'll work on it. And I said, oh, me? And he said in that this, this is with uh, Professor Banerjee and Professor Kramer. 
And I said, oh, you want to talk to him? <laughs> <laughs> and so then they talked to him, and then they went back to us and said, well, would, would you be ready for a, phone, uh, for a press conference in an hour? We should make a cup of coffee. And Abhijit said, I'm going to go back to bed. <laughs> and so I woke up, I got up, I got showered, etc., and then he went back to bed. <laughs> I took the press conference. Mind you, they had said they wanted, they wanted just one of us, so that was fair enough. And then we started they, the they day. They even said they wanted you because they wanted a woman. <laughs> and I didn't qualify. <laughs> So I actually have a question from the internet, but I'm going to let you read it. They sent in French. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> and they'd like you to answer in French, if you wouldn't mind. Should I translate, or should I read in French and answer in French? You should answer in French, but for the room, you could do it in English. So the questions are, um, what does this prize signify for you? Que signifie ce prix pour vous? Number one. And number two, is it the proof that your approach is the right one? Uh, Est-ce que c'est la preuve que votre approche est la bonne um, Que signifie ce prix pour nous uh, Je crois que, ah, comme Abhijit l'a dit, c'est la consacra, consécration du tra, du, du, des progrès qui, a été accompli, uh, jusqu qui, a été, qui ont été accomplis jusqu'ici, à la fois uh, par nous, mais surtout par uh, uh, tous les chercheurs qui travaillent avec ces méthodes, tous les partenaires, tous les gouvernements. Et c'est aussi euh, un espoir et une indication que ça va nous donner encore plus d'énergie et encore plus de vent dans nos voiles pour faire, pour faire mieux, pour continuer à affecter la vie de, de centaines de millions de personnes dans, dans le monde. Euh, Est-ce que c'est la preuve que notre approche est la bonne Non. Euh, pour être honnête, euh, c'est la preuve que euh, des, nos très respectés, très respectés collègues suédois pensent que notre approche est la bonne. Euh, ce qui est... Mais évidemment, il n'y a pas de preuve que notre approche est la bonne. La... S'il y a une preuve que notre approche est la bonne, c'est que la vie de... des gens qui sont affectés par, nos... par, par, les poli... par les politiques que nous essayons d'étudier est améliorée. C'est la seule preuve qu'on peut vraiment apporter. We have one from the bridge. Someone there? Hi, can I go ahead? Yes. Uh, great. Congratulations, uh, professors. Could you please summarize for us what your work means for governments and institutions who are in a place where they can intervene in a material way for improving outcomes among the poor? I mean, there's always a little bit of uh, hope in for what we do. So it's not that, I mean, governments are free to not use our evidence. But to be honest, I think my, our experience over the last 20 years has been, you know, when you, 20 years ago, you go and tell somebody in government, we're going to do a randomized control trial, and they look at you like you had just escaped from some mental health institution. Uh, now they look at you and say that, Okay, is that is that expensive? Does it has anybody else done it? Uh, can you can, can you sh can you give me an example of somebody powerful who has endorsed it? But they ask the right kinds of questions, and and we we, we get to the second base, not always uh, all the way, but at least there is some sense in which um, they're open to the idea that evidence is valuable, that we know something, and that might actually be useful to them. One in the room. Oh, yes. Good morning, just for the layman who may have no idea what you've been doing or familiarity with your work. Can you just sort of explain in layman's terms what you did? <laughs> yeah, let me maybe give you a, an example, a concrete example. Maybe that's the easiest. So um, we run what's called randomized controlled trials. And the, uh, the objective of randomized control trials is to, to run an experiment to see whether something affects something else the way you expect or in a different way. So I'll give you an example. Uh, several years ago, we were uh, interested in trying to understand uh, why people do not immunize their children and what could be done about it. 
And we spend a lot of time in, in India, in a very remote places, uh, uh, in, in Rajasthan, where immunization rates were very, very low, of the order of you know, less than 5% full immunization rate. The, the, the prevailing view at the time was that the, the, the main problem was uh, that immunization services were not reliably available, and that's why people wouldn't get their immunization. And it's true that re immunization services are not re reliably available. Sometimes you walk for a long time to go to a public health place, and then you arrive there, and it's shut, and you come back. You've lost the day, no immunization. That's kind of frustrating, and then people don't do it again. But uh, because we spent a lot of time in this place and we interviewed people, uh, we realized that another issue is that uh, people are always busy with other things. And with immunization, if you don't do it this month, you can always do it next month. It's really not ever an emergency. So it's never really on top of the list for people to do it. And this, the small cost that it means to go there and get it done might be too, too high, even if it's a very small cost. So we thought, okay, let's try and, uh, and test these two ideas. So we worked with a wonderful NGO called Seva Mandir, and they, in turn, teamed up with the government and told the government, we are going to replace you for an area, and we are going to provide golden plate immunization services, very reliable services every month, available in pe at people's doorstep in villages. And then on top of that, uh, so, so what they did is that they picked 120 villages, randomly, that is literally with a, a random number generator, the modern equivalent of a dice, picked half of them and put in place those services uh, in half of those. And then out of those 60, again randomly picked 30, where uh, they uh, provided people with a very small incentive to show up to the immunization camp was a kilo of lentils per shot and a set of plates when you finish. So they did that. They did that for a year. And what we did is that we collected data on emission status before and after. And because the places were randomly selected, there is nothing different about them except the intervention. Any difference that we find can be confidently attributed to the program. So what we found is that in the status quo villages where nothing particular was done, Immunization rates, uh, by the end of the experiment, were 5%. In the places where uh, they had done the, the camps, but not the, the small incentive, immunization rates has climbed to 12%, which is good. It's more than doubling. But in places where they had indeed put, on top of that, put the small incentive, immunization rates were 37%. So that gave us the kind of indication that this was important. And from there, we go in two directions. In the policy direction, we pointed out that it's actually cheaper to give incentive than not to give incentive, because the nurse has to be in the village anyways, and if she immunizes more kids, it's, it's cheaper per shot. So it's a good policy to pursue. On the sort of intellectual side, it sort of got us to think about why is it that a small incentive can persuade people when you would think that it shouldn't really be pertinent and got us to think more about you know, what, how people make decisions, is it that, what are they, their understanding of the healthcare system, what are their understanding of the future and the present, and, and things like that, which has kind of spawned the whole agenda on understanding this type of behavior. So that's an example that should clarify. Now multiply that by 1,000, and you have the JPAL uh, type of work. Any in the room? Oh, you get it. Tom again, yeah. Where, where, are you, uh, where do you want to take care of your work now? I think, I mean, to be honest, I think we, we hope that we'll do, get to do more of the same. I, don't, I think, we, I think we're, we are actually quite excited about what we are doing. This was not work that we did a long time ago. We're excited about what we're doing now, and it's, it's fun. We are learning new things. Um, I'm really excited to look at the results from our latest intervention. It's, um, so I think what I hope this will do is just open more opportunities to do more inventive things. I don't expect to do something entirely different. I think it's, I'm content with what, what I'm doing, enjoying it very much. 
I think maybe one thing that we have started to do, not just us, but uh, you know, Ben over here and various people in the network as well, is uh, working with governments uh, and working at scale with governments to help them uh, evaluate both new approaches but also better ways to do things that they want to do anyways. Um, so this is a larger project, for example, I give you the example of the immunization project which was in 120 villages. We are currently analyzing an immunization project in the state of Ariana that has 2,000 villages and where the results that we are finding will lead to statewide scale up of whatever works the best. So, so that's kind of one place in which we are taking it, uh, which is working directly with government on large scales. And the other place, and I, th I think that's really, again, not just us, but the entire network, is we are constantly blown away, literally, by how imaginative people have become in terms of how they can deci design projects we, which not only help us see what works and what doesn't work, but help us understand much better how people behave, or how government behave, or how politicians behave. Uh, and um, in, you know, with, with wonderful imagine, imaginative designs. And we want to do you know, our best to be part of that to the extent we can, or support it to the extent we can. So this question comes from Julia Hood of Business Insider. For you, Professor Duflo. She asks, you are the second woman to receive the Nobel Prize in Economics. What is your hope for the profession in terms of inclusion? So there are not enough women in the economic profession uh, at all levels. There are not enough uh, undergraduates who choose to take economics. There are not enough graduate students who continue. There are not enough assistant professors. There are not enough, uh, enough tenured faculty. Uh, so the, the reasons why there are so few women who get the, the, the the Nobel Prize or other prizes is not because the people who give prizes are not are, are discriminated against women. It's because the entire funnel is just not big enough. And that's not true just for women, I should say. It's true also for minorities. Um, there are not enough African American in the economic profession by any stretch of imagination. In fact, it makes women look positively uh, numerous. Uh, when, and that has to change. But I think the, the reason it's the case is because um, it's two. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong on the, but that's my understanding of the, the reasons. One is the, the, the climate is uh, a little bit tough and uh, aggressive, and it doesn't work for everybody. And in particular, it's less likely to work for women than for others. This is something that the profession is starting to reckon with, and that's wonderful. And I think we'll get. We'll, we'll get to the bottom of that, it will take some time, but I think people are much more aware of that it is an issue. I was not aware it was an issue myself because I don't mind aggressive, it doesn't trouble me, but it troubles a lot of other people and that's unfortunate and it should not be. There's no reason to be aggressive anyways. The second reason I think is because um, I think many women do not think that economics is all that interesting. Because the vision that economics is is, oh, it's something, you know, maybe having to do with finance or big macro policy or whatnot. And it has very little to do with the problem that I care about, many women care about. And the, the, the truth is that's not true. <laughs> that in fact, a lot of economics is about the type of work we do, obviously, but the similar work uh, on, in public finance, in labor economics, et cetera, in the, in, on the US, on, on issues that are important, education, health. But people don't know that. Uh, it doesn't really percolate. And one, we should also remember that there are not very Nobel Prizes that has gone to people who mainly work on social problems. And so being a woman working on social issues, I hope that it can also be kind of a role model for others to think, you know, look, actually, it's pretty interesting, this field, and it's much more varied than you, than you think. I just want to add, I wonder, one piece of, um, just take pride in one thing, which is that in our specific little uh, corner of economics, the field of development economics mm -hmm. has many more women than most almost any other part of economics. And um, for example, we have a seminar series that uh, Harvard and MIT jointly run 
this semester, it turns out that um, I, I rashly said that all those speakers are women. But, and this was not because of any design. It was simply because these were the best people and they were invited uh, to give, come give talks. Turned out I was slightly wrong. There were actually two men. But, so I, I think organically, it, it is a field where I'm consistent with maybe what Esther said, which is that maybe some parts of economics are not so interesting to women. Uh, we don't have anything like the, a comparable deficit, which I, I, I really do want to take some pride in. Any more questions in the room? All right, we have just a lot of cards from the internet. <laughs> Leticia Hernandez with El Financiero in Mexico, she asks, the United Nations warns that the, the, the pace of the fight against poverty has fallen, especially in Latin America. What policies should governments prioritize to have effective results in reducing poverty? Health, food, education? In some ways, I think one of the way, ways in which we distinguish ourselves is by not answering those questions. Uh, I think we, we'd like to answer these questions after we do the homework. Uh, uh, having a, a one answer for all of Latin America based on ha never having really studied Latin America, that would be irresponsible. I, I don't think, uh, I, I think that would be bad advertisement for our particular style of work. So uh, that's to say, I won't answer it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have another one, which maybe will be a will not answer, but we'll ask. Um, so NW18 Bengali News asks, what is your opinion on the state of the economy in India? What's in store for the future? And they ask if you could answer in Bengali. He has an opinion about yeah. <laughs> uh, that. Yeah. That's, that's a statement not about what will work in the future, but about what's going on now. That I'm entitled to have an opinion about, <laughs> I feel. Uh, the economy is doing very badly, in my view. Um, it's, uh, if you, one of the numbers that just came out is the, uh, the national sample survey, which comes out every one and a half years or so, and it's a, 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 it gives you the average consumption in urban and rural areas in India. And the fact that we see in that is that between 2014, 15, and 2017, 18, that number has slightly gone down. And that's the first time such a thing has happened in many, 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 many years. So that's a, that's a very so glaring warning sign. I, there's enormous fight going on in India about which data is right, and the government has a particular view of all data that's inconvenient to it is wrong. But no, no, nonetheless, I think that this is, this is, this is something that uh, I think even the government is increasingly recognizing that there is a problem. So the economy is slowing very, very fast. How fast, we don't know, because there's dispute about data, but I think fast. He did ask if we could do some of it in Bengali. Uh, no? Sure. OK. okay. Uh, what can we do about this? OK. Let me, let me do, I'll say the whole thing in Bengali and then translate. তবে যতটুকু বলতে পারি এখনকার মতো এই যে আমাদের মনিটারি পলিসি রেজিম যেটা আছে যেখানে 4% এর বেশি 3.5% এর বেশি ডেফিসিট হবে না এই সব নিয়ে মাথা ঘামিয়ে লাভ নেই এখনি ইকোনমিতে খানিকটা আরো পয়সা আনতে হবে এবং গরিবের হাতে পয়সা দিতে হবে বড় লোকের হাতে পয়সা দেওয়া নয় গরিবের হাতে আরো বেশি টাকা আনতে হবে সো আই ডোন্ট নো exactly what to do. The government has a la large deficit, but right now it's sort of at least aiming to please everybody by pretending to hold to some budgetary targets and monetary targets. And my view is that this is the economy going into a tailspin is the time when you don't worry so much about monetary stability and you worry a little bit more about demand. I think demand is a huge problem right now in the economy. Thank you. Julia Hood with Business Insider has a follow-up. How does political upheaval domestically and globally impact your work, either at the research level or in its practical applications? Does the private sector step in? There are a few questions in that. She's referring to the US? Political upheaval. Political upheaval, domestic or global? Um, I don't think there is any direct impact uh, on our work uh, in the sense that we can mostly continue doing what we are doing, 
Um, but there is certainly an impact in terms of uh, what we think is important and where we should direct uh, our energies, uh, where we should try and understand a bit better. When you see the, the upheaval that takes place, for example, here or in France or in the rest of Europe, then we feel, oh, you know, we, we should also start thinking about, is there anything we can bring to understand these issues? Uh, and even if it takes us slightly outside of the comfort zone of our work till date, maybe relying on all of the expertise that our colleagues have. So I think it's more a matter of reorienting our brains, both in terms of specific kind of issues and even on the geography of where those issues concerned, uh, are concerned. It's, it, in a sense, it's kind of brought home for me, the, the current... Uh, problems that the, developing, the developed country faces brought home for me that the, even when people's basic material comfort is more or less sustained by um, the fact that they live in an environment with reasonable uh, safety net, their full life might have the same level of uh, misery and, happy, and, and happiness that uh, some of the extremely poor people we study. And therefore, that is also something that is worth thinking about very hard. I used to think, and to, some, to a large extent, I still think I should direct my energy in thinking about the poorest person in the world, and then the second poorest person in the world, and then the third poorest person in the world. And now I realize that, although that's, of course, different to live uh, in the middle of nowhere uh, and trying to deliver a child and it's not going well and there is no hospital. That from feeling miserable having lost your job in a mining town in the US, one also has to understand those issues. So building on that question, Swati Save of Mosique magazine. Um, asks about the trend in deglobalization and asks specifically, are Brexit, America First, and several other protectionist campaigns an outcome of capitalism gone wrong, in your view? Is this a will not answer? This is a small question. <laughs> um, I, so let, let me... Um, so I think they are a consequence of us not taking the consequences of globalization seriously. I think globalization was hurting. Our, as economists, our presumption is that that hurt is temporary and it goes away quickly because people react to the, that by moving and changing jobs and retraining. We know now that those processes are slow and as a result, people actually get quite badly hurt. So I, I think it is a sense in which I would say it's not so much that, um, I don't know whether this means capitalism went right or wrong. It does mean that I think the way the policy responds to the pain caused by globalization was inadequate, often even in the wrong direction. So I, I do think that that's what it's partly telling us. And a student from the internet asks, um, for you, Professor Banerjee, what is your feeling about being the sixth Nobel laureate from Kolkata? <laughs> Young student. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I assume they're all much more distinguished than me. <laughs> and, <laughs> any more in the room? So we have two children, age five and seven, who believe that uh, they are the center of the universe, and they do not uh, accept kitchen table conversation. <laughs> so that has kind of the kitchen table part was had to had to go. Everything else is fair game. 
So we, I think we, you know, our work is our life, our life is our work. I mean, there are a lot of things we, we love to do, but it turns out you can do a lot of things we love to do while cooking. Uh, Abhijit spends a lot of time cooking, and we can cook and talk about whatever is happening. Uh, we talk while walking to work and coming back, and we also talk about the children when we are in the office at MIT. <laughs> so I guess it's like a, a mix. <laughs> Any more from the room at the phone bridge? All right, we might be in our last one. It's another one asking if you might answer in French. So I'm going to. I could try and sing in Bambi. I could try, yeah. <laughs> could do both. Uh, it's uh, from Radio Canada. Uh, vos commentaires au sujet de la place des femmes en économie. Oh. I already said that in English, but they want it in French, I guess. And et les prochaines étapes de votre recherche, the next steps of your of your um, research. Donc je vais résumer ce que j'ai dit en, en anglais, en français. Il ah, n'y a pas assez de femmes qui font de l'économie euh, à tous les niveaux, que ce soit parmi les étudiants, parmi les étudiants en thèse, parmi les euh, jeunes professeurs, les professeurs euh, plus âgés. Et c'est quelque chose qu'il faudrait changer. En, les sciences ont fait un, énormément de progrès pour faire euh, entrer les femmes à, euh, dans la carrière scientifique. Mais en économie, ça ne s'est pas produit. Et là, là, en partie parce que je ne pense pas qu'on avait réalisé jusqu'à assez récemment quelle était l'ampleur la, du problème et la nature du problème. Et finalement, la, la perte énorme qu'il y avait pour le champ de ne pas avoir plus de femmes en économie. Euh, parce que la diversité des opinions, la diversité des expériences, la diversité des intérêts fait aussi la, la richesse de notre, de notre domaine. Donc, euh, je pense que c'est en train de changer parce que cette réalisation commence à la fois avec un changement dans la culture de notre profession et aussi peut-être avec une meilleure communication de ce qu'on fait, ce que les économistes font et pourquoi c'est intéressant, même pour des, même pour des femmes. Euh, et, et donc, j'espère que dans une certaine mesure, cette occasion euh, contribuera euh, et que je, je puisse servir peut-être un peu de, de, de modèle, de rôle modèle, que c'est quelque chose qui peut se faire. Les prochaines étapes de notre recherche, je ne les vois pas tellement différentes des étapes précédentes. Hein. Je vais continuer, euh, continuer mon travail, continuer avec, euh, à, à m'occuper de Djepal, à, à faire des expériences dans de, dans de nouveaux endroits, des petites, des grandes, des moyennes, essayer de continuer à, à jouer un rôle pour euh, améliorer la vie des... Euh, des plus pauvres et aussi peut-être des, des, des personnes un peu moins pauvres mais qui souffrent quand même dans leur esprit ou dans leur corps. And are there any more in the room? Student? No? Okay, then our last one is going to be something of a layup, I think, to highlight your website. So a journalist asks, how can we learn more about the methodologies to make randomized controlled trials that will impact our societies? That would be a nice one to end on. That, 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 that feels planted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't plant it. <laughs> oh, um, one more. So first, uh, we encourage you to go to uh, the website of uh, the Poverty Action Lab, where all of our work and the work of others is uh, um, uh, described, displayed. So that's uh, www.povertyactionlab.org. Uh, That sounds really presumptuous, but uh, we have a book. Uh, the, uh, well, we have two books. <laughs> One of them is, uh, has been out for some time, and it's Poor Economics. And uh, it's a book that uh, builds on the research of all of the field in development to try and explain uh, what is our understanding of um, the problem of poverty, education, health, governance, etc. It also explains the methods in, in a lot of details. So that's a place. And even more presumptuous, we have another book <laughs> coming out in a month uh, that's, called, <laughs> that's called Good Economics for Hard Times. And it's a 300 pages elaboration of what we just discussed today, uh, how the times are hard. Uh, and uh, they are hard for people in much deeper way than perhaps we had realized. And it turns out that economics has a lot to say about why the times are hard and what to do about it. 
And the, unfortunately, again, the vision that people have of economics is not that. Uh, they think economics are, economists are not to be trusted. In fact, uh, the only people who are less trusted than economists about their own field of expertise are, as, are politicians, uh, both of which are not very good. Um, and so what we are trying to do in this, in this book is rely even more on the research of other people to um, show what economists have to say that's in a more subtle and useful way on the big problems that affect us today, that's immigration and trade and automation and the rise of uh, bigotry and, uh, and, and also, of course, since this is our sensibility, on uh, social policy and what to do about it. So that was the advertisement plug. <laughs> Just, so it's been an amazing, nearly hour-long <laughs> press conference that we've had you up here. So thank you so much for your patience and time. Um, just for those, um, just a journalist, just a few housekeeping items. Those seeking images or more information from MIT, the email is um, questions at mit.edu. We'll get you what you need. You can also look for us in the room. The faculty will be here for a little bit doing some one-on-one -on -one stand-ups with some of the cameras. And then the webcast will be archived online, and we will have an audio recording of today's event that we can share with you. Thanks again to all who could join us. Congratulations. Our event is concluded. Do we have a room we can take them?